Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Judah Adarit of Princeton Capital Group. Before we dive in, I want to ask you a real quick favor. Would you mind taking an extra 30 seconds and heading over to iTunes to rate this podcast with five stars? This helps us get more listeners, and it means the absolute world to me. So thanks for making my day with that five-star review of the show. All right, let's dive in. Judah is the principal and founder of Princeton Capital Group, a commercial real estate loan broker with a specialty in manufactured housing communities. Judah has closed 40 manufactured housing community loans over the last 12 months and 150 over the last five years. Judah, welcome to the show. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Like, it's, been, it, it's been too long, and it's a real honor to be on here. Awesome, man. I'm excited to dive in and, and unveil some golden nuggets from your perspective as a, you know, on the financing side of this, uh, this industry. So sure. maybe you can, you can start out, Judah, by telling us your story and how you got into uh, mobile home park community lending you know, out of everything. Sure. That's actually a great story. So my background has been real estate, families in real estate. Um, when it came time for uh, me to get into the family business, I was kind of looking to see if there was anything else within the industry that's not on the owner operator side. Um, and that's when a couple of people suggested to me, hey, how come you don't look into the finance side of the business? learn that side of the business and see if you'd enjoy it. And I, and I did. So I joined a firm, a uh, national mortgage brokerage shop called Eastern Union Funding. I joined around eight years ago. And one of the first things that they do is they, you're a loan originator. So you're sitting out there making cold calls. They give you a list of leads. And I requested that my leads be out of state because as opposed to other brokers that love doing deals within their market, I just found that the New York, New Jersey market where I'm based is flooded with mortgage brokers. And when you head out of state, there's, there tends to be less competition. So I went for the easier uh, kill, as they'll say. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I would say probably three, four months in, I was making my, my cold calls and a gentleman picks up on the other line. And, hey, it's Judah calling from Eastern Union Funding. We're, you know, we're, we're national brokers and gave my whole little spiel. And he says, do you guys finance mobile home parks? And of course, I'm trying to say yes. I mean, of course, yeah, obviously we, we, we finance mobile home parks. And he starts asking me some questions and became apparent within the first 30 seconds of his questions that the man he was speaking to really did not know anything about mobile home parks, let alone the financing mobile home parks. So he was extremely nice. And instead of just hanging up the phone said, it seems like you're new at this. Would you want to get me on the phone with one of your senior loan brokers? So I was relieved and I'm like, yeah, that, that's, that, that's great. Let, let, let's do that. <laughs> I, I told him I would send him a, an email with an invite to a call with a senior loan broker. And then I was tasked with finding out which senior loan brokers in Eastern Union have ever done a mobile home park. Mr. Mark Trapp actually was the only broker at Eastern Union that at that point had ever financed a mobile home park. So I approached him and he said, yeah, yeah I, I have done a couple. Um, I'm happy to get on a call. Long story short, we got on a call with that particular gentleman who is now today from my most uh, uh, dear clients and close friends. And we've done numerous deals together. And that's how the first, my first introduction to mobile home parks came. And I was fascinated by the asset class. I was fascinated by the fact that it's an asset class within multifamily, but yet it's so different in so many ways. I was fascinated by the fact that there were so many lenders out there that do love mobile home parks and you just have to find the right lenders for the right deals. And most of all, I love the fact that there were very few, if any other mortgage brokers that made this a focus on this niche. And um, I still love that. So, you know, and 
it kind of snowballed from there, as, as you know better than I do. The mobile home community is a, really a very small community. And, and to the point that I started going to some of the mobile home park conferences, I learned all about mobile home parks from the ground up, how they're run, why people buy them, the depreciation factors, sorry, and finding which lenders would be interested in what type of deals. And slowly, you know, by word of mouth, really at this point, I've come to, to a point where close to 70% of the deals that we at Princeton Capital Group are arranging financing for are in the MHC space. Wow. So that's it's been an amazing ride. Yeah, yeah, that is that is so wild. You know, people that have been in the business, I would say, you know, uh, over over three years or so, it seems like somehow they they fell into the business. It wasn't like they were seeking it. It kind of just they fell into it. And then yeah. the people that have been in the business in the last three years as mobile home parks have gotten more popular, you know, uh, it, it's a different story. It's kind of the sexy asset class. So <laughs> Uh, that's, that's very cool. Thank you for sharing that with, uh, with the listeners, Judah. So this is like one of the questions I ask everybody I interview and it's, it's probably the most important. Uh, what do you think are the most important things that passive investors, you know, we're talking limited partners here need to look out for when investing into mobile home parks. And you know, this could come from your perspective as a, a loan broker. Or as a, an LP. Or as an LP, yeah. Yeah, so I'll just start out by saying that I, I, myself as a loan broker, obviously I know that side of the business, um, but as a loan broker, I got the opportunity to see the even the down and dirty of deals, that you might say, and, and know exactly what might be wrong with the deal. And at the same time, I've invested numerous times as an LP into deals. And at this point, I would say, 90% of the deals that I personally invest in are mobile home park deals for many of the different reasons that we might discuss soon. But I would say an LP has to look out, look out for very similar to what they'll look out for when they're looking into a multifamily deal, whether it's the operator's experience, the returns, making sure that the, uh, the sponsor, the GP is being conservative in his expectations of expense growth and rent growth and all of that. But on top of that, there's two particular things that I myself look out for. Um, and that is, if you're buying, if you're investing in a deal where somebody might be buying their first multifamily deal, and until now they were kind of busy with fix and flips or manage the property for somebody else, it's, as long as you feel that this guy kind of knows the business and it's not that complicated, then you can feel confident investing in him as long as he's being conservative with the numbers. When it comes to a mobile home park operator, I feel it's even more important that that person has real-time experience in mobile home parks, whether as an owner that this is not his first deal, but I don't want to give all the newbies here a bad rap that they won't be able to raise equity for their deal. So it's, and I've invested with first timers. But it's those first timers that have some sort of, they've had action in the mobile home park world. And they've seen what can go wrong in a community because there are so many things that can go wrong in the community that a new sponsor might not be ready for. But if it's somebody that has some sort of experience, that's what I look out for. Um, it could be managing a park. It could be experience that he was sitting alongside another sponsor and watched what went on for six months. But just to see the ins and outs, that's number one. Number two is on the just on the number side, I always look to see if, for example, somebody's buying a park with a, a bunch of park-owned homes, I want to see if those, if the returns that they are um, promising or expecting, are those including park-owned home income? Is that not including park-owned home income? Because if it is including park on home income, then you have to ask the sponsor the question, are you planning on keeping that income around or are you selling those homes? And if you're including that income to tell me my returns, how is that sticking around once you get rid of those homes? Those are the two things that I myself as an LP look into when investing in a loan park deal. Yeah, that's very good, uh, good advice. You know, 
the experience of the operator. And then number two, the, the number of park owned homes. I think that gets overlooked, you know, especially as people try to convert these assets into fully tenant owned home communities, you know, that income is not going to be there forever. So if they're planning on that in the pro forma, you know, that's going to affect your, your long-term return. So thank you for that, Judah. Uh, sure. Next question here. What matters most when getting a mobile home park financed? Like, like what are your top five things that lenders are looking for and base their financing terms on? Okay, so as, as a loan broker, I'll tell you the, the five things that I look out for when somebody calls me and tells me they're looking at a mobile home park deal for me to size it up correctly and to determine which lenders to go to. Um, let's see if I can find five, but I think I typically have four. The first one is going to be the occupancy at the park. So a lot of times you'll get a rent roll from rent manager or one of these other ones that only list the occupied lots. So I'll get a rent roll to 72 lots and I'm sizing it as a 72 lot park. And then I'll go onto the county website and it says 140 lots. And so that's number one. What's the actual occupancy of vacant lots and, and with, with homes on them? Number two is the percentage of park owned homes versus tenant owned homes. Number three is the quality of the asset, whether it's paved roads, um, skirting, but, you know, does it look like a community? Does it look like a park or does it look like a trailer park? You know, kind of put those, put that into the right category. So I'll ask for pictures of the park to get a feel for what the park looks like. Um, number four, I would say is going to be the, you know, figure out the expenses on a T12. Are those associated with park owned homes in the case that there might be park owned homes? And Number five is I'll ask them for, you know, their profile, right? So whether it's their personal financial statement, real estate schedule, bio, that's the five things that I would ask for to present a deal to lenders. And that's what a lender will determine a lot of times based on the park on homes, based on the percentage of occupancy, based on, uh, you know, that's how they figure out the NOI for their loan um, debt cover and obviously the experience of the operator plays a big factor and a big role, depending on which lenders you're going to, obviously, but it can, it can really play a big role in whether or not we'll get certain lenders to even look at the deal. Yeah, no, that's, that's great feedback there. Tell us about the lending options available for manufactured housing communities and, and mobile home parks. Maybe walk us through each, like, you know, agency, CMBS, life insurance companies, other national lenders, and, and then local banks. Like what, what, yeah. uh, Maybe just walk us through that. That'd be great. Oh, um, all right. So the cream of the crop is obviously the agency loans. Those are non-recourse, no personal guarantee loans with long-term fixed debt, whether it's 10 years, 12 years, 15 years. You can even get, you know, at times Fannie Mae has a product out there with 30 year fixed that not many know about, but it's available typically at lower leverage. The agency loans potentially could go to 75%, 80% loan to value. Their rates today are super aggressive because of where the treasury is. So you're looking at the low threes and with Freddie Mac, probably below 3% fixed for 10 years. Um, but they are pickier and we can get into that, um, but they're, they're a lot pickier when it comes to the asset class. I like to tell people agency does not finance mobile home parks. That's a myth. They finance mobile home communities. So when you get your park to the point that it's a community, or if you're buying a park in an acquisition, and us at Princeton Capital Group can present the deal as a community versus a park, that's when agency will look at it. But obviously, those are that's your best option, especially if you're looking to hold these long term. But sometimes it might not be your best option if you're buying a park that might fit the agency box day one but it has rents that are 150 bucks below market. So you don't want to lock in long-term debt. That's when I would go to the national lenders, the regional banks. Some of the national lenders out there can be non-recourse, but they're few and far in between. I would say when you're going to a national lender or even, a, and especially the regional banks, you have to expect you're going to be taking at least a certain portion recourse, um, but they can be, pretty aggressive too. We've had some national lenders out there that rival agency debt at times that when treasury has gone up and agency loans have been 
rates of the mid fours, you still have some of those regional banks that are in the high threes on the rate. They would be at a 30 year amortization at times, but I would say to assume a 25 year amortization with those banks. But real quick on the agency lenders, you know, maybe you could touch on some of the qualifications, right? Like, you know, expected percentage occupied, percent of park owned homes, you know, off street parking, you know, I've heard, you know, curb and gutter, you know, some of that kind of stuff is pretty important to understand what you're talking about, the community versus the park. Yeah. Okay. So there's very simple um, guidelines within Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, And it's, you know, a lot of times people are like, well, where does it say that in the guidelines? You can actually go onto Fannie Mae.com or Freddie Mac.com and the guidelines are listed right there um, under manufactured home communities. So the official guidelines, and keep in mind as I tell you these guidelines, that there are waivers that you can get on any one of these guidelines, whether it's the percentage of park owned homes or anything else that we'll list shortly. You can go for waivers, but obviously you can't go for a waiver on every single one. And what will determine whether you get the waiver is A, the size of the loan. If it's a larger loan and it's more attractive and they want to, you know, they want this loan and it's a more experienced um, you know, borrower that has other agency loans, they'll be, they'll, they'll tend to give that waiver easier. So just keep that in mind that with agency loans, there are waivers available on all these guidelines. But the, the guidelines are basically, yeah, like you mentioned, they want to have on an acquisition, not more than 35% park owned homes. And on a refinance, not more than 25%. Because they're expecting that by the time you're ready to refinance, you should have lowered that ratio. Um, it gets tricky when it comes to RTOs or LTOs, different ways people phrase it in the industry. When you have a, a home that's on a rent to own schedule, how the agencies look at that. Do they look at that as a park owned home? So that will depend on what the schedule is. If those homes are paying off within the next year, then chances are we can get the agencies to believe that that's really a tenant owned home already or very close to it. So therefore, give me that waiver that I'm asking for. Um, next thing is they want to see paved roads. And, that I've very rarely seen a waiver on, that they're very strict on, because that really determines the way a community looks. I mean, you drive in and it's nicely paved, that's a community. If it's not paved, it, it's not really a community. So paved roads, if there's some parts that are not paved, they might hold back some money for you to pave that post-closing, especially in acquisition where you don't really control what the park's gonna look like. They wanna see all the homes skirted. They want all the hitches to be covered. They want curbs or at least rolled curbs on the side of the road. Um, And I would say last but not least, they want the homes to be in decent condition. So even though they're telling you, hey, we want to park with all park on, with all tenant owned homes, and maybe you can't control what that home then looks like because it's not your home, but they still want it to be a community. And they expect that if they're lending on a community, the residents within that community likes their home to look nice. So I've had times where borrowers actually went and gave an allowance to their tenants. Here's five grand. Here's two and a half grand. Fix up this home. I'm having an inspection come, you know, from Fannie or Freddie over the next two weeks. Let's get this repainted. So that's not, it's really last but not least, because that's what they look at also. And it's something that can kill a deal because, and, and borrowers are frustrated. Hey, it's not my home. I don't control that home. I don't know what you want me to do. Well, it's a little bit too bad. So that's the agency uh, kind of guidelines on what they look for. And, and I would say as far as loan size, just touch on the loan size here. They do have a minimum officially of 1.5 million on their loan size, but I've done, you know, smaller than that. I've done a $1.2 million loan. Um, I think with somebody that, you know, and we've done, you know, we've done smaller than that, but typically they won't do under a million and the larger the loan, the more attractive the rates get and the more they'll be um, you know, willing to give you some more interest only and waiver on their uh, guidelines. Wonderful. And I think one thing was occupancy. Is it true that they have to be 90% occupied or higher? Or is that another waiver that you could probably get? Yeah. So sorry, I forgot to touch on occupancy. The occupancy that officially is in the guidelines is 85%. Um, as opposed to multifamily where it's 90% because they do expect that mobile home parks are not going to be running at the same occupancy 
And um, it's been a longstanding argument between a lot of the larger operators and Fannie and Freddie is why are you considering this a vacancy? It's, there's no home there that's vacant. It's a vacant piece of land, which is a great argument, which I don't really think they have a good comeback for, but they still count it as vacant. So keep in mind when you're saying vacancy, even if it, any sort of developed land for if there's cement pads there, if there's utility hookups, that's considered a vacant pad. But yes, there are waivers available all the way down to 70%. So, but you won't get that waiver for a loan, you know, call it under $3 million. Once it climbs above that 3 million mark, they'll start looking at giving that waiver. And as the loan amount climbs, that waiver can climb that the occupancy doesn't have to be as high. We've done loans as low as 72% occupied, you know, some nicer communities. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And maybe you can briefly touch on like some of the other options, you know, CMBS and, you know, uh, just kind of the, the terms and what's, what the difference is between those options versus an agency lender. Yeah. So CMBS is another great option, another great non-recourse long-term fixed debt option. The difference between CMBS and agency is really in, in two things. First of all, they're slightly more costly to do because of the nature of CMBS. So CMBS stands for Commercial Mortgage Backed Securities. They are Wall Street lenders. They're packaging up those loans and selling them in pools. Once it's sold off, it's securitized, as they say, and it's it's off the shelf. Um, it's more costly for them to do the transaction, so they pass on those costs to you. So you have to just be ready for a slightly more expensive closing than a typical bank closing. I'll tell borrowers, factor in another 1% of the loan amount as a closing cost if you're doing a CMBS loan. Between title costing more and their their attorneys cost more, just everything costs a little more. But the main difference is if you go for an agency loan, so everybody likes to talk about the prepayment penalties. So a bank typically has a prepayment penalty where a, a step down, 5% the first year, 4% the next year, 3% the next, following year, et cetera. With agencies, typically, even though there are other options that we can discuss, Typically, it's a yield maintenance or a defeasance prepayment penalty, which basically, in layman's terms, means you're not refinancing that debt. But the agencies do have an option for a supplemental loan where you can go back to them a year or two after you got the original loan, say, hey, I've raised rents, I've cut expenses, cap rates have compressed, all that together. I would like the, my loan to value today is only around 60%. I want to bring myself back up to that 75%. They will allow you to take a supplemental from them at a slightly higher rate than your senior loan, but it's a very attractive option. And so as much as you're stuck in that yield maintenance loan for the 10 years, during that term, you can go for two supplemental loans. And a buyer, if you're selling a park, you can sell that park with the loan. He can assume that loan that you put on there at low rates and still take a supplemental to bring himself up to a normal leverage point with CMBS that does not exist. So there is no supplementals. So if you're taking a CMBS loan, I would say it's either if you're buying a park that's already at its peak of, of uh, you know, occupancy and everything else, or if you've already brought the park up to a place where you're ready to put the, you know, like I said, I put it to bed. You're really putting it to bed. And if you don't believe that there's any significant rent growth still to be had or infill or anything else, but because there's no supplementals and anybody that's a even though they are assumable, but somebody that's going to buy the park from you, if cap rates will compress or if there was rent growth, and then he's buying the park and you're like, well, this park's worth $12 million today. He's like, well, you only have a $7 million loan that you're trying to sell me on. That is going to be a lot tougher. So that's something to just consider when you're looking at CMBS. But otherwise, it's a great option. It's also non-recourse. They'll give you the 30-year amortization. They'll give you a few years of IO. Regarding banks, so it depends on the size of the deal. And it depends on the amount of park-owned homes. I guess the number one question that I get is, do, can we get deals done if there's fully park-owned homes? Do lenders count that? So agencies, CMBS, life companies I did not touch on. I haven't done any life company deals. I've attempted three. And I can't find the client to be a guinea pig for the fourth. So I, there might be other, other groups out there that go to life codes. I personally don't. But with banks and national banks or regional banks. There are plenty of national banks that can count park on home income. 
some of them need to take the homes as collateral because they're counting that income and some don't, um, which those are like the diamond in the rough, you know, like count that income, but still don't take the home as collateral, but that does exist. So, and they're typically, you know, five-year terms, five-year fixed loans versus the agency longer. And they'll be, but they can also throw in a year of IO, two years of IO. They can be a 30 amortization. You got to assume probably 25 amortization. And you probably have to assume a four to four and a quarter on your rate versus the agencies today that are a lot lower. Yeah. You know, thank you for that overview. That was, uh, that was, that was really nice. Tell me, sure. tell me, tell the, the listeners about loan to cost and how operators can better understand this as to not, you know, over promise and under deliver on their pro formas in regards to, a, you know, the amount of cash that they'll be able to pull out at a refinance, yeah. you know, above and beyond the initial investment dollars. That is a great question because I just got an email this morning from a client and I'll give you just a brief background as he put this deal a year ago, exactly August of 2020. And he bought it, you know, at a time where I'll read you his answers and then you'll understand what his goal was. So his response to me this morning is classic problem of buying stuff for 50 cents on the dollar. Number one, this would be a recourse loan. Number two, would they rather have an okay debt yield on a new acquisition or a great debt yield on a cash out refi? Number three, this appraised at 2.6 when we bought it. It's approaching 4 million in value. And we only bought it for 1.8. We've invested significant money into home turns, lease up, continue to execute. It's not just buying cheap. It's clear and meaningful income growth. So his response is to my email to him last night saying, I'm still getting pushback from lenders on your loan to cost here. Um, so that's just one example of what I face daily. And this is, this is what I go out and fight for. And I say, you know, tell clients that this is, this is what I love, love doing. I love going out and fight for this. But this is a classic example of somebody that bought a deal a year ago. He's done a tremendous job. Not only has he done a tremendous job, when he bought it, the park appraised for $400,000 more than he was buying it for. And he went out and today the, this park all day long, I agree with him, is worth $4 million. But he bought it for 2.2, I believe was the number. Now it appraised for four, now it would appraise for four million. He wants to, a year later, get 70% of his appraised value. And he's done work. And I personally believe I will get this for him. Because when there is a story and a real story of growth and a real story of um, whether it's expense cutting and together with top line growth and infilling homes, then yeah, you potentially from some banks can get them to look the other way as far as your costs. But just to give you going back to agency, and a lot of times that is where somebody's goal is. And I've seen some you know OMs from operators saying, hey, in two, three years, we will refinance. In two years, we'll refinance the agency debt. And then they have their own expectations of getting you know 100% of the money out. The rule of thumb for agency is within the first year, you'll, they'll give you 80% of your costs. Keep in mind, your costs can include any CapEx closing costs. Year two, they'll give you 90%. Year three, they'll give you 100%. And then after year three, they'll give you whatever you'd like. That's the rule of thumb. But at many times, if there's a real story, they will, and you can really present the story in the right light and show what you've done to the park, then you can shorten that timeline, but not by that much. They won't give you, agency will never give you 150% of your money after year one. Even if you bought a park that was 50% vacant and the 50% that were there were not paying rent. And I've fully infilled the park and I've gotten everybody to pay rent. And now this park was worth a million dollars last year. I've sweated and I've poured tears into this park and now it's worth 5 million bucks. Can I have 3 million? The answer will be no. Um, but there are some options of going to another bank that understands the story, a regional bank that really likes you and likes the park that potentially couldn't get, could get past the loan to cost issue. But it definitely is a real issue out there because a lot of sponsors, syndicators, owners, operators are buying parks that with a value add plan and they deserve their money out. Not because, you know, lenders like to say, well, you have no skin loan left in the game well all my skin is in this park yeah like i've sweated and i've done who knows what to this park so come on give me credit for it so 
the agencies are a little bit harder on it, but I would say the uh, it, you're, if, if your goal is and you need to get out your capital sooner, I would say probably go with a regional or national lender unless you can wait the, you know, at least the full two years and then go out to agency because you have a much bigger chance of then getting you know, 75% of the appraised value today. That was huge. That was a that was a golden nugget right there. For those listening, like yeah. what we just discussed, like that's your your takeaway from this episode because that was a struggle that you and I ran into on a deal yeah. we were working on, and uh, you know they want to see that the funds are seasoned and and it's the properties you know getting used to the the new occupancy and things like that. So that's just something for for newer operators to be aware of. Is hey, you, you know you're not always going to be able to flip into agency within you know a year or two. Uh, and pull out all of the money you put in and even more than that based on the new uh, the new appraisal. So thank you for sharing that, Judah. Sure. Um, one quick thing I wanted you to touch on, you know, is it true that loan brokers can like add a spread onto the terms given from a lender and make money on that spread? Sure. And is that common, you know, practice in the, you know, the MH space or is... I would really hope not. I mean, it's really... It's really tough to say, I man. I, I can't vouch for other mortgage brokers out there, or um, you know, other loan brokers out there. I would say it's like any other business. It's not specific to the mortgage business. Definitely not specific to the MH side. Mm-hmm. It's like when you're using any other, um, any other one of your vendors or anyone else that you have a relationship with. It's really about trusting their relationship. Like I told a client, and I've told this to numerous people over the years. If you have to ask that question, whether or not your loan broker or mortgage broker is skimming some off the top, then it might be time for a new mortgage broker, or it might be time to solidify that relationship with that broker, sit down over dinner with him, get to know him a little better, let him, let, and get a feel for, is this the type of guy that I want as, you know, it's a relationship. It's more that than anything else, because obviously if they're adding a spread, that means potentially your rate is not really what the market rate is, um, which is why I don't believe that it's commonplace. Uh, I, I just think you know, uh, most brokers want to come out of the gate being the most aggressive yeah. and they want to bring their borrowers the most aggressive rates. They don't want to bring a borrower a rate of 3.5. And then Judah Adarit is going to call the same borrower and say, hey, I know you're looking at that deal. I can get you like 3.3. And this guy's eyes pop out of his head. 3.3 from who? Well, from Fanny. I just got 3.5 from Fanny. Well, there might be something little fishy there. So that's why I don't think it's commonplace. Is it done probably the same way skimming is done in any other uh, industry? And how would an operator, you know, make sure of that? Just look through the the documents ahead of time just to make sure that that's not being done? Yeah. So the, in the typical Fannie or Freddie application, there is a section there that says, and it should say, I don't know if that's foolproof though. Um, I've heard that there's times that, that that's not foolproof. But again, if I don't know that there's any way to really be 100% certain of it. So like I said, if you, if you don't feel 100% certain, then you got to sit your broker down and be like, dude, I know that there is such a thing out there. Maybe get them to send you an email. Like if you don't really trust them, then come to me. But if you don't want to come to me, then Nick, no, on a serious note, get them to send you an email. I dot, dot, dot will be, uh, you know, not taking any spread from the lender um on this deal you know just tell you me personally princeton capital group i do want my lenders to give me something because it's only fair i give them a nice amount of business but the way we have it structured is hey judah if you bring us x amount of deals this year and we do over x amount of dollars we'll you know we'll go out for a nice dinner i'll we'll buy i'll buy you a nice watch i don't have the nice watch yet but that's kind of the way i like to then i'm incentivized and they're incentivized to get deals done. Um, and they're incentivized to treat me well and to give me what I ask for at times and stretch because they want to keep their loan brokers happy. But keep in mind, the guys that are skimming off the top, they kind of get a bad rep over at the Fannie and Freddie servicers also. It's like, all right, here's this, this guy that's always trying to just make the most out of every single deal instead of trying to get the most deals done. Sure, sure. Judah, what does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes and why? Hmm. 
That's a tough question. If I was looking to buy a mobile home park, I would probably buy one with infill opportunity, low rents, a good bonus. Um, and the why is very simple. I don't want to be spending any money on the bones of the park, the water lines, sewer lines, or fixing up you know real structural issues. But on the flip side, I do want to have some value add there, and uh, that that would be my dream park. Go in there with either a bank loan or even a bridge loan, and infill, bring up rents to market, refinance two years later, hold it long term. Love it, love it, Judah. What common mistakes do new operators make in their assumptions for financing? Number one, first and foremost, is the assuming that. Uh, that agency will do a park that is might be a beautiful community, but has a bunch of or a ton of park owned homes. So they're underwriting with agency kind of sizing and agency debt terms when in fact it's going to have to go elsewhere. Yeah, that's the most common mistake. That's huge. Yeah. What hurdles does the manufactured housing industry face moving forward? From the financing side, I don't see any. I mean, I see the opposite. I see more banks opening up to realizing, hey, smell the coffee. Mobile home park communities have been the lowest um, default rates across the country. Why are we not lending on them? Um, I think it's mostly ignorance. They just don't know it. And so I just see more lenders getting into the space. I see it you know, over the last six months. I've seen some lenders wake up and finally start calling me as a broker and saying, can you teach us about mobile home parks? Um, and number two is I think agency will start counting some park on income more. Some way they count laundry income in a multifamily property, or they might get a little more flexible on their vacancy when it's a vacant pad. I just see good things coming. That's great. Yeah. And, and during COVID, you know, I know there was like some reserve requirements and things like that. Uh, yeah, that's gone. That now that that's gone, that's great. But it, I thought it was a good sign that they were still lending during that time. They didn't yeah. shut down entirely. So, sure. Yeah. That's great. Uh, tell us a little bit about Princeton Capital Group. You know, what makes you guys different? What's your value proposition? <laughs> so, thank you. I guess I, we don't have a secret sauce. There's no secret banks that we know about that nobody else knows about. I mean, in the manufactured housing world, given that it's a primary focus of mine, I obviously might know today of some banks that others might know about, but in a few months, those same other banks might be known to other brokers and they're not like hidden banks. They might be the regular banks that people know about, just don't know that they lend on manufactured housing. I would say anybody that comes to you and says, Hey, I have a lender that nobody's heard about. And, you know, let's go do a loan with them. You should probably think twice. So there's no secret sauce here. It's not like we're bringing you to any secret lenders. Um, it's in the manufactured housing world. We know it well, we've done it. We've overcome hurdles. We know what, roadblocks or road bumps to expect on the road. Um, and more than anything else, we're, we're a boutique mortgage shop. I was part of a larger mortgage shop, a more national mortgage, larger firm. Um, and not to speak ill of any of the large firms out there, but it's a different mentality. It's a different culture. The culture of Princeton Capital Group is that you're family. And all of my clients know that they can reach me anytime of day and night, whether there's an issue or they just want to catch up and schmooze. It's Every client is not just a number. It's a real relationship. I keep up with my clients. We service our clients with, you know, everything we've got. And I think that that's kind of the difference between a boutique mortgage shop and a larger mortgage firm is every deal gets its focus that it needs. We're not servicing, you know, X amount of clients. It's each client to his, to his you know, own. And, you know, we leverage that on both sides of the aisle. The banks appreciate that as well as, I'm not just another guy that they're getting a call from, from this large firm. It's somebody that they know already that we relationship with. And um, that's what we try to do and try to bring the most aggressive financing that we can find out in the marketplace. And uh, confident enough to say that when it comes to mobile home park financing, there won't be anybody that will find you something more aggressive unless it's a bank that I haven't heard of, which is possible the same way I have banks probably that they don't know lend in the space. But otherwise, if we know the space well. We know how to squeeze deals into the agency box sometimes that otherwise shouldn't have gone there. Um, 
and just uh, you know keeping up that that relationship with our clients. Awesome. And uh, Judah, how can our listeners get a hold of you if they would like to do so? They should contact uh, Andrew Keel. He's always very nice to just forward those emails along. But uh, <laughs> no, the like anybody that wants to reach me can call me on my cell. My cell is uh, 848-222-0738. Um, if I don't answer, just shoot me a text. Don't leave me a voicemail. Um, or they can email me at uh, judah at princetoncapgrp.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Judah. It was an thank absolute having pleasure having, for, having you. Uh, one, one last final That's tip fun. for passive mobile home park investors. What would it be? Uh, take Andrew Keel a lot more serious. <laughs> awesome, Judah. Well, thanks again for coming on, man. That's it for today, folks. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you, Andrew. Would you like to see mobile home park value add projects in progress? If so, follow us on Instagram at Passive MHP Investing for photos and awesome videos from our recent mobile home park acquisitions. Once again, that's at Passive MHP Investing on Instagram. See you there.